Glory to God. If you'd open your Bibles this morning to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Um, what's today's date? The 28th? Today is the 28th of June, but by the time we meet next week, next Sunday morning will be July 5th, the day after uh, July 4th, obviously. July 4th is the day that we celebrate our, our nation's independence. Glory to God, aren't you glad you live in a country such as ours? A nation like ours. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, America was uh, founded, it was settled by people looking for a religious freedom. Amen? Amen. Now, if you were to read some history books or such as that, or listen to the revisionists of today, you, you wouldn't know that. Uh, they're trying to destroy that. They're trying to get rid of all that. So it's uh, incumbent upon us to make sure that uh, we know ourselves and, tra and train our children up, amen, so that they know what really went down. Uh, you know, America, again, America was settled. I want to read an article to you. It was settled by people looking for religious freedom. Let me read for just a moment. Our earliest settlers were people who came here primarily looking for religious freedom. Other nations, for the most part, came into existence by conquest uh, for selfish and ambitious, ambitious motives, but it was primary, primarily in the atmosphere of God, not gold, that America was born. The hardy souls who sailed on the Mayflower in 1620 fled from uh, tyranny and oppression, and in the Mayflower compact which they signed beneath the swinging lantern in the cabin of their ship, they proclaimed that they had come to the new world for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. In the early colonies, the first public building to be erected was a church house. The first public exercise was the worship of Almighty God. When sorrow came, they gathered at the church to appeal uh, to God for help. When the bountiful harvest filled their barn, they gathered at the church for thanksgiving to God. In 1643, as more and more people arrived on these shores, they uh, joined together to form the, the New England Confederation. They wrote a constitution, the first constitution written in the New World, and it began with these words. Whereas we all come into these parts with one and the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel in purity and peace. You probably didn't read that in your history book last year uh, in the high school. These are our spiritual forefathers who came to the shores of America so they could worship and practice their faith without fear of persecution. So the first thing that's right with America, okay, is that the earliest settlers came here primarily looking uh, uh, for religious freedom. In other words, I can say it like this this morning. They were, put, they were trying to position themselves to be blessed. Okay? The earliest settlers were trying to position themselves for the blessing of God to come on their life. And it didn't stop with them. Our founding fathers, let me read on. Our founding fathers, a term used for American males during the Revolution, uh, Revolutionary War, especially or specifically the signers of the Declaration of, of Independence and those who drafted the Constitution, wanted to do the will of God as far as our country was concerned. A study was done over a 10-year period. Political science professors at the University of Houston collected and cataloged 15,000 writings by the Founding Fathers. Their goal was to determine the primary source of ideas behind the Constitution by identifying the sources quoted most often by them. Guess what the primary source was? 94% of the quotes came from the Bible. 94% of the quotes of the founders of our nation were based upon the Bible. Can I tell you again, they were positioning themselves to be blessed. They were positioning this new country to be blessed. Can you say amen? Amen. I mean, for instance, let's just suppose this week on, 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 on the TV, on the news, that you turned on the television and you heard these announcements. Number one, the Supreme Court has just issued this statement. Divine providence, that's God, has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Imagine if you heard that on the news this week. Or you heard, inquiries by our reporters reveal that almost every state legislature has passed a law requiring all elected officials to take this oath. 
I do profess faith in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, His only Son. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be given by divine inspiration. What if you heard that on Fox News this week? Or legislation was passed today in Congress to affirm that the Congress, is, uh, the Congress of the United States approves of and recommends the Holy Bible for use in the schools. What do you think the response would be to those kind of announcements being made? Amen. Huh? Well, I mean, I mean, we, we have protested in the streets today. We have, we have, you know, we have this 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 idea of separation of, of church and state. I mean, so ingrained of, uh, wrongly, I might add, to the point that even the church starts proclaiming separation of church and state with with some of the things that they say. But from my understanding, the whole idea behind church and state, the separation, was to keep the state out of the church, not the influence of godly men and women on the state. As a matter of fact, if we go back to what I just said about the Constitution, everything about the Constitution and the thoughts behind our founding fathers was to have the influence of the church on the country they were building. Yeah. Oh, there'd be a reaction when those things were announced. Every one of these statements uh, is, is a historical, accurate fact. It was John Jay, the very first Chief Justice and often called the Father of the Supreme Court, one of the primary writers of our Constitution who wrote, it is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. It was the state of Delaware. <laughs> Delaware, along with most of the others, which required office holders to take an oath affirming their Christian faith before they could take office. Congress in 1782 approved the use of the Bible in our schools. And in 1844, when someone sued to remove them, the Supreme Court ruled, why should not the Bible, and especially the New Testament, New Testament be read and taught as a divine revelation in the schools? Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? Just think about this. If these people who were so instrumental in the establishment of our nation, if this were the things they were saying and they were doing, uh, and, and it caused us to be the country that we became, uh, you know, if that was today, they'd be considered far-right radicals. They'd be considered people that had lost their minds, according to uh, mainstream media. I don't think that's an exaggeration. I don't think that's an exaggeration at all. You wouldn't find a headline. What you'd find that today's headline is protesting in the streets. Okay, statues being vandalized and tore down, um, <laughs> you know, trying to eliminate history. Uh, white Jesus can no longer be tolerated. I mean, did you watch the news last night? Just, just ridiculous stuff. As a people, as a country, the Bible says this, uh, Psalms 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. In other words, a nation, any nation, talking about our nation, however, is blessed because of a People that claim God as their savior, not because of not because of some political stance or because of some expression, but because blessed is the is, is the nation whose God is the Lord. Our nation's blessed because its people are blessed. That's what brings the blessing. These anti-God uh, positions that we find they're they're not they're, they're not the positions that our our country was founded on. Our country is blessed, church. Because they were in a position to be blessed. We need to position ourselves to be blessed, friend. I'm going to say, God wants you blessed. God wants you blessed well. Amen. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. What does the Bible say? We love it. Well, 1 Corinthians 2 where it says, Eye hasn't seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it even entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2.9. I mean, think about it. it. From the beginning, in the book of Genesis, God created a perfect world, a perfect man, and in this perfect world, he took a perfect man and put him in an extra special sweet spot. Why? Because he wanted to be blessed and blessed well. In the Old Testament, we read how the how God brought his uh, the nation of Israel into a land, he, he, a land flowing with milk and honey. He said, here, here's cities that you didn't build, be blessed. Here's all of God groves you didn't plant, be blessed. How much more so for a New Testament believer? Can you say amen? amen. Who, who God dwells in, the Holy Spirit abides in, the Bible tells us. One of the reasons we haven't been walking, however, in all this blessedness that he's planned for us, uh, 
in all that the Bible says as believers, as born again believers, we should be walking in. In my opinion, it's because of the position we find ourselves in. Okay? The Bible tells us God has a place for you. It's a blessed place. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Amen. And he delighteth in his ways. But so many times we find ourselves not in that blessed position. We find ourselves out of position to receive his promises. Out of, out of position to receive his provision. I mean, how many understand this morning? You can be born again. Your name written in the Lamb's book of life. A reservation in heaven for when you leave this earth. But not enjoy the promises and the privileges that God has for you here. Right now. Save, but, you know, free, but living life like you're in bondage. God wants to bless you. So many times, God wants to bless, but so many times he can't bless. Why? Because people aren't in, they haven't positioned themselves to be blessed. I remember there was a time, Mark 6, 4, in the ministry of Jesus. How many believe Jesus could probably bless somebody? That in the ministry of Jesus, where he came upon a people, and the Bible says he could do no mighty works there. It didn't say he would do no mighty works as if it was his decision. No, it says he couldn't do no mighty works. And the Bible tells us why. Because they didn't believe. In other words, they were not in a position to be able to receive. And thus he couldn't do nothing for them. Friend, if we haven't been believing, trusting the Bible, obeying his word in certain areas of our life, it'll cause us to be out of position. Come on, church. If we haven't been following the, the promptings, the leadings of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 14, trusting Him, being led by the Spirit, walking by faith, then we can find ourselves out of position. I'm not talking about being lost or, 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 or being unsaved. I'm talking about not walking in the promises that God said we can walk in now. I'm so glad of what's all going to take place in heaven. Believe me, I'm real glad. But it seems to me the majority of the promises of God that I find in this book relate to my life here. And how it could be for me. It tells me how it's going to be for me. But the promises of God suggest how it could be right now. How many today want to be in position? In a position to be blessed. In a, in a place where, you, where you're so, I mean, everything's prosperous about your life. You're blessed. You can be. And that, but that's your decision. That's not God's decision. We already know his position concerning blessing you. He said it's better to give than to receive. Guess what? Or more blessed to give than to receive. Guess which part of that equation he's on? The more blessed side. The giver of every good thing. Amen. We know his position concerning us. He loves us. He so loves us, the Bible says. When's the last thing, time you so loved something? Oh, yeah, he told you how much he loved you, but he left you. She told you how much she loved you, but he left. If, if she so loved you, she wouldn't go in anywhere. God so loves us that he gave himself for us, that he came that we might have life and that more abundant. Amen. Church, it doesn't matter what you may be facing today, where you may find yourself. It could be a bad health report, a bad financial report. It could be like hell at your house. It could be like hell when you go to work. Perhaps the devil himself has taken time to come against you personally. If you'll hear and obey God's word, if you'll listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, you can, you will pass through all that adversity. Somebody say amen. amen. Hey, that's what happened here in 2 Chronicles. We find the nation of Israel, I mean, King Jehoshaphat is surrounded by enemies on every side. Things do not look good for, for, for Judah here. Uh, they look grim. The nation's about to be taken over. The king has nowhere to turn but God. Amen. Anybody ever found himself in that situation? Nowhere to go but God. You know what he does? He does the wise thing. He turns to God. How many understand you shouldn't wait till the end of things to turn to God? Come on, help me this morning. You shouldn't wait till everything's out of hand before you turn to the Lord. Can I let you in on something? That's exactly why everything is out of hand. Because you didn't turn to the Lord when you should have. Don't wait till everything's gone to hell. And then now you want to run to the Lord. You know what I'm saying? He's okay with that. But why wait? So many folks just want to do their own thing. Uh, just I'm, I'm, and, and friend, when I say folk, I'm talking about church folk. Just want to do what they want to do. No thought to whether God's in it or if it's part of their plan for their uh, uh, for, his, for their life. They, they just want to do what they want to do till everything blows up. Then it's Jesus. Heck, why not call on Him in the first place? Why you got to wait till everything's out of hand and then call on the Lord? But if you didn't, hear me this morning. If you didn't call on Him when you should have, 
Make sure you do now. Amen. Amen. I said, if you didn't call on the Lord when you should have called on Him before everything went south, call on Him now. Amen. Glory to God. Don't be hard-headed now. Don't be, now's not the time to be stubborn because you missed it once. Don't miss it twice. Well, I call on now. It's just, no, call. <laughs> Don't start thinking, well, you know, it's just too late. He won't help me now. I've blown it too many times. I, I, I just, I just, I just gone too far. Friend, as long as you got breath in your body, somebody say amen. It's not too late. Hey, I'm telling you, it's not too late. He's not like us. He, God don't hold grudges like we do. Y'all, y'all know what I'm saying. Well, they need that bed. They just want to lay in it. <laughs> they didn't want my help back when I was offering them my help. Fine. Oh, now you want my help. That's too late now. I would have did it back when I said I was going to do it. But now you didn't want it then. Now you want it? Friend, we may be like that. I mean, go ahead and just look at the person next to you. Because they may be like that. <laughs> but God's not like that. I said God's not like that. Amen. Hallelujah. Give him praise. Give him glory. He's not like that. I said you may be like that, but God's not like that. You may, you may still be mad from the last time they did you wrong. You know what we say. Shame on them the first time. Shame on me if it happens again. Well, I'm glad God's not like that. That's all I got to say, I guess. <laughs> I guess yeah, I'm glad he don't think like that. Y'all have never met me. <laughs> Samantha would know me. And Mandy would be here. <laughs> I'm not sure about Eli, Priscilla, and Wyatt. <laughs> Jehoshaphat's in trouble. And the only, re the only reason he's in trouble is because he hasn't been listening to God. I said the only reason the, the king of God's people is in trouble is because he hasn't been listening to God. Matter of fact, if we were to read a couple uh, chapters prior back in 18, he's hanging out with King Ahab. How many of y'all not to hang out with Ahab? But there's, here's a godly king hanging out with an ungodly king, and guess what? Trouble comes his way. He finds himself out of position to be blessed. You understand that these Old Testament stories were written so that we could make the connection. Here's a godly person hanging out with somebody he shouldn't be hanging out, and now troubles come their way. We understand that's the whole. It's not that you would know. You know, God didn't preserve this so you would know who King Jehoshaphat was. He preserved this so that you would understand godly people shouldn't hang out with ungodly people. It's going to cause them to not be blessed. That's the whole purpose. Not so you would know Jehoshaphat's name. Okay. He's in trouble. He cries out to God for help. God answer him, answers him through the prophet. Amen. Look what it says, verse 15, uh, chapter 20. And he said, uh, Hearken all Judea and, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat. Thus says the, the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Hallelujah. I mean, no, that's a good word right there. I mean, as if you've blown it and you've been acting the fool and now, God, and, that, and, that, and now you've turned to God for help and God says, I got this, that's a good thing. Amen. The battle isn't yours. It's, 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 it's the Lord's, amen. How'd you like to hear that for yourself? Amen. Oh, well, you just did. <laughs> but the prophet didn't stop there. Look what he says. Tomorrow... Go ye down against them. Behold, here's the word of the Lord. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Oh, you talk about some, you talk about a good word. And we all like a good word. Somebody goes, I got a word for you. And they start saying things like, the battle's not yours, it's the Lord's. He's going to fight for you. You're like, yeah. It's a lot better than some of the other words you might have gotten in the past. <laughs> you don't need to fight in this battle. Oh, true that? Look what he says. Set yourself. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord who's with you. Set yourself. The Amplified Version says, take your position. New American Standard Bible says, station yourself. The NIV says, take up your position. Friend, God's telling them to do what? To position themselves. To be blessed. To position themselves. Amen. And if they'll position themselves, 
He'll take care of everything. Y'all with me today? That's what we're talking about this morning. Positioning ourselves so that God can move on our behalf. Being in a position that God can move in your life. That God can do what God wants to do in your life because you're in a position to receive it. You're in a position for him to be enabled to act. See, we act like everything's all up to God. Just like, I mean, God's just going to do. God's sovereignly in control, and he's just going to do what he's going to do. Like, like we have no part in positioning ourselves to be blessed. No, you have a part, friend. Positioning ourselves, aligning ourselves with God so that he can bless us. Look what he says in, in verse 17. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who's with you. I like that word, salvation. That's full Deliverance, that's protection, that's favor, that's health. Friend, that, that's what it's like when God's with you. Is God with you? Yeah. Amen. Is he with you this morning? That means he's for you. And if God be for you, who can, who, can, who, can, who can be against you? In other words, who can succeed against you? Look at how they position themselves. Look, look at this. Verse, eight, uh, verse 18. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord worshiping the Lord. How they positioned themselves? They worshiped. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. They praised him. Come on somebody. Verse 20, and they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. They trusted his words. They positioned themselves. How? By worshiping, by praising, by trusting. What about you? What about this week when your situation showed up or your problem developed or there was a circumstance in your life? What did you do? Did you freak out? Did you mull over? Did you scream, what are we going to do? Or did you worship? Did you praise? Did you trust God? What was your first reaction? The diagnosis was bad. Lord, I honor you and I trust you and I worship you. Lord God, you are my healer. You sent your word. You healed my disease. And I praise you. I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. Amen. And amen. And that's the last word. And you drop the mic and walk off. Is that what you did? Or did you? Fear grip your heart. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to call a prayer chat. Well, that's good. You know what I'm saying? But you already let fear grip your heart. Deal with that real quick. Did you freak out, dwell on, mold over? Look, look, look at verse 21. Look what happened when the people positioned themselves. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, when? When they began to sing and to praise, not before, but when they started singing and praising the Lord, set ambushments against the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, which uh, were come against Judah, and they were smitten. I love that. Literally, the, literally that, and that's translated, in singing and praise, his ambushments were set. Oh, come on, church. Hallelujah. When you begin to worship and praise the Lord, hallelujah, he'll cause a surprise. You know what an ambush is? That's a surprise attack. Amen. But with, they began praising the Lord, and, and the Lord surprised the enemy, started attacking the enemy in their life. In other words, they started praising the Lord, and the Lord just nipped the problem in the bud. <laughs> they weren't freaking. They weren't. They were praising and worshiping. Verse 23, for the children, look what happens when they started praising and worshiping the Lord. The Lord said ambushments, verse 23, for the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, uh, everyone helped to destroy each other. In other words, they turned on, if you'll start praising God, I'm telling you, it'll cause, it'll cause confusion to come into that, that situation that's against you. Amen. They started praising the Lord, and the enemy that they were facing turned on each other. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. When's the 
last time you started praising and worshiping God in the face of your problem so that God could allow the problem to, eat, to devour itself? Come on. God gave us this story. Not so that we would know that King Jehoshaphat was being attacked by the people of Ammon and Mount Seir, but that we would understand that when you got a problem, if you'll praise and worship him, he can take care of the problem. That, that's, the, that's what he wants us to get. If you don't remember anybody else's name, where they were, what chapter it's in, learn the lesson that the Bible is trying to teach us that. God will fight your battles for you if you'll worship him. If you'll roll it, cast it into his arms. If you'll give it to him, amen. amen. Their enemies were dead. Look at verse 24. And when Judah came towards the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked into the multitude, and behold, the dead bodies everywhere and fallen to the earth. None escaped. Here was this great problem. They didn't know what to do, so they turned to God, and God caused the problem to take care of itself. And when they got there, they just walked into victory. Woo! I'm telling you, the enemy was defeated before they ever got there. The first thing that they saw on the battlefield was victory. The first thing, the next thing they heard about this problem that they were worshiping God about was that it was already taken care of. How many does that, how many does that work for you today? If you start worshiping and praising God because he's got, he's got this problem, he's got, he's, he don't take care of this problem. Friend, the next time you think about your problem, it'll already be taken care of. Hallelujah. Enemies already been wiped out. First thing they see when they get to the battlefield is victory. That should be our position, amen? I said that's our position in Christ Jesus. He's already wrought the victory, amen? It's done. It's finished. It could be just like this for you, amen? That's why we have this story. God says, look, this is what happens when you do this. When you position yourself like this, this will be the result. Hallelujah. But notice so many people want, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What they do? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. What am I going to do? What they do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that. What am I going to do? What do they do? Because I want the result they got. So if I want the result they got, then I probably ought to do what they did. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's fine. That's not real. If we have to go over that part again, then... <laughs> Then, then please make sure you're here for every Sunday school class that we have and every Wednesday night teaching and Sunday night prayer. <laughs> and we got to start all the way back over to that, that point. Look at verse 25. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies, precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering the spoil. It was so much. How many knows you blessed when God fights your battle for you? You allow God to fight your battle for you. And how many knows if God's the one fighting for you, he, he does that exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask type stuff. You know what I'm saying? Glory to God. There's so much blessing laying around here at the point of victory, it takes them three days to gather it up. That's how he rolls. Amen. That's how he rolls. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And you know what they call the place? Verse 26. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of Bercha, which means blessing. The valley of blessing. Glory to God. Well, what else do you call a place when you show up to fight and the battle's already won and you're picking up three days all you can tote off? They were in a position to be. Don't you know they left happy? Matter of fact, the Bible says that. The Bible says, verse 27, they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go unto Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them rejoice. Over their enemies. Happy, happy, happy. That's what I'm talking about. Glory to God. They were in a position to be blessed. What about you? What position are you in this morning? Are you in a position to be blessed? Psalms, uh, Psalm 1. Let me read it while you're turning there. Psalms 1, verse 1 says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. In other words, if you want to be blessed, you can't allow yourself to get out of a position by receiving ungodly counsel. Blessed is the man who doesn't do those things. Twisted counsel. I mean twisted. I mean twisted from the truth of God's word. Friend of um, when you have the same opinions or the same attitudes about things that the world has, 
That's a good indicator. It's probably not God's attitude about the situation. Just to be plain. If you're saying the same thing that everybody else in this world says about a situation, it's probably a good indicator that it's not God's view of it. It's kind of like when I hear certain political parties talking and their stance on things, even if I don't know exactly what's going on, it's a pretty good indicator that I'm not for it. Just because I know the players involved. I can, my, gut, my gut reaction at first is, I'm against it. <laughs> I don't know what all it's about, but I know who they are, and I know what they stand for. So if they're for it, that's a good indicator that I'm not. Then I'll find out what I really feel. Then I'll find out some more information so I can stand on my own. But if what you believe is the same, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're more, if your morals and your, and your thinking process and all that is the same as, as, as how the world would present it, that's a pretty good indicator, indicator that it's not God's attitude on the situation. I mean, the world will tell you uh, survival of the fittest. Dog eat dog. You better look out for number one. But God doesn't say that. He says if you want to be the greatest, you, may not, you need to become the least. You need to serve if you want to be the greatest. That's not what the world teaches. Having a scornful attitude. Scorn means to mock, to ridicule. The Bible tells us that those kind of attitudes knock us out of position to be blessed. If you're just uh, scornful and just, and just uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sarcastic about everything. You'll find yourself out of position to be blessed. But you want to know what puts you in position to be blessed? Look what look at verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, the word. And in his law does he meditate day and night. Look at, look at the result of this position. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Man, when you meditate on the word of God, amen, you're like a tree planted. I mean, you just don't go digging up trees and planting them all around. You know, a tree, a big old giant, it's established. It's, it's grounded. It's not like a pot, potted plant where, where if you don't go water it, you know, my wife's got some flowers, and if she don't water them every day because they're, pot, they're in pots, if she don't go out there and water them, you can tell they didn't get water because they ain't, they're not established. They'll move around with every little doctrine. <laughs> every little thing moves them. But if you'll get grounded in the Word of God, established, you'll be planted Planted, one, 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 I think one Bible verse says, he who is planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. You planted, that's a blessed position. Glory to God. Let me ask you this morning, what's your position? What's your position? Where are you standing? Are you standing in a place of blessing or in a place where the devil seems to just want to kick your teeth in? Ephesians 4.27 tells us, give no place to the devil. You say, but I'm not. But yet, bang, 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 bang. When you're out of position, you're given a place. To steal, to kill, destroy. And he will. That's what he does. And mom asked Sally, why did you let the devil uh, make you kick your brother in the shin and pull his hair? Sally said, well, the devil made me kick him or pull his hair is my idea. <laughs> Come on, that's not to get you out of position, friend. Right. One more quick verse. James chapter 4. One more and we'll, we'll close for this minute. James, the fourth chapter. Some powerful verses on our position. James 4, I'm just going to start with verse 6. It says, But God giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resist the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. What powerful verses in, 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 in relating to one's position. Submit yourself. Draw near to God. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, verse 6 said, if we would humble ourselves. In other words, position ourselves. Submission, that's a, that's a, that's a positioning, Okay? Drawing near to God is a position of blessing. It's a place where your enemy must flee. Draw, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. Draw nigh to God. And he'll draw nigh to you. When you submit to God, you're positioning yourself close to him. 
When you draw nigh, you're, you're, you're dwelling in the secret place, Psalms 91. And when, when your claim is in the blood, amen, when, when you're the branch connected to the vine, John 15, when you choose to walk in the spirit, the devil will flee, friend. You'll be like Jesus and, and he'll have no place in you. Glory to God. You can't resist the devil without submitting to God. You can't. Devil whip you. He can't whip God and he can't whip you in God. You in Christ. Friend, I'm telling you, the devil isn't mentioned in the first two chapters of the Bible when God started all this, and he's not mentioned in the last two chapters of the Bible when God wraps all this up. The devil just ain't a problem for God. Okay? And he's not a problem for the believer who will submit to the will of God, who will draw an eye to God, who will find himself in that position. But he is a big problem. He's a huge problem for anyone in any area of their life that they won't submit to God. It's a huge problem. Submit. We don't like that word. I understand that. You mentioned submission and folk want to get defensive, okay? The word submit literally means to, to, to line up under. It's like it's like it's like a I, I, like a private in the military, okay? Uh, they're under the absolute authority of his commanding officer. How many understand that private is told when to get up, what to eat, when to go to bed, everything. He's under that, he is submitted underneath that. That's his place. That's his position. Friend, any area of your life, somebody say any area. Yeah. Because we act like it's not any area, it's just. Right. No, any area of your life that's not under God's authority cannot resist the attacks of the devil. You're born again, but your wallet's out here? You don't trust God with your finances? Well, then that thing's, that thing's not in. I remember, I remember reading one time one of the illustration books where it talked about the armies. I forget who the king was. Some, 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 some of England's you know crusaders or such. They said they would go. They had a big. They had a big you know vat that they would march into a you know just a, what is called a vat. And when they marched in, they'd hold their sword hand up because that every part of them was baptized except for the killing hand. You know what I'm saying? Just their way of thinking. They didn't put that part in. They were submitted to God, you know, in their thinking except for this hand because this hand's going to kill. You know. Some people, some people walk through that vat with their wallets. <laughs> they're, they're all the way in except for that wallet sticking out. Come on, somebody. Tell me, Jesus. If you can't handle your family according to God's word, that means it's not under God's authority. How about your family, friend? And that means it can't resist the attacks of the enemy. Because how do we resist the devil? We submit to God. The devil's attacking your family. Is your family submitted to God? Head of your family, head of your household. If you don't handle your money according to God's word, it's not under God's authority. Nothing to prevent the enemy's attack. You name it. Your personal life, your children, your job, your relationships, your finances, your thought life. Any area of your life that you've chose to close off to God, to not submit, it's open for an attack. And it will be attacked. You can believe that, friend. See, you may, be, you may be here this morning, and I like to say it like this. You may think you've been resisting, but it could be that you've been assisting. You may think you've been resisting the devil because, because you showed up here today, but it may be that you've been assisting him in every other area of your life. Giving in place. What's that? That's being out of position. Oh, you can tell. You can tell if you're out of position. How, Brother Tommy? By how high you jump when the devil says boo. You can tell exactly what position you are when the devil says boo. I never heard the devil say boo. Well, when they look at you and say, I've got bad news, you got. That's the devil going, boo. You can tell what position you're in by how high you jump. What's the Bible say? Your enemy, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion. In other words, he's always roaring something at you. You ain't saved. I'm going to get your kids. Your business is going to fail. You're going to lose your wife. You can't quit booze. Uh, you're always going to be a dope head. You're a bad mom. You're a, you're a bad, you're a terrible dad. You're a loser. What, he's, what's he doing? He's trying to get you out of position. He's, roar, he's going about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. He's, he's, he's roaring at you and, and seeing if you're going to flinch. Remember that message? Seeing if you're going to flinch. You remember that game we used to play as a kid? Go like that, somebody, if they did that, well, then you got to hit them. That's what the enemy's doing. He's, he's, he's roaring at you, and if you flinch, I see that flinch. 
looking to see how much he really trusts God. Well, well, you better not tithe because that's all you've got to last till the end of the month. Well, friend, how submitted to God are you? It's just a question. Don't answer me. Answer him. In other words, do you trust him with your money? Now, I mentioned money three or four times in the last couple minutes, so you don't leave here. I preach always talks about money. Y'all have ever been to one of my offerings? About a minute, three, 30 seconds. We don't just preach on money. But Jesus said, if you can't be faithful with what he called the least, you won't be faithful. You won't have, in other words, faithful, full of faith. If you can't be full of faith, trusting God in concerns with your, in, in relation to your finances, you won't be full of faith, trusting God in, in, relate, in, in relating to anything else. Because he called, you know what he called? Trusting him with money? What do you call it? The least. He called it the easiest thing you'll ever have faith for in the kingdom of God. The least important thing. That is interesting to me. You ever wondered that, what, you know, why's God so, why's God so, 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 so this tithe and this giving issue? Well, it's not because they're going to turn the lights off in heaven if we don't give. The Bible tells us that tithing teaches us to trust God, to put God first. And Jesus called it the least. I told I told him, I think I took up the offer with him. The Lord showed me this last week. I, I made a decision. I made a decision. If I fail in my faithfulness in some area, it's not going to be the least. <laughs> if I'm not full of faith when it comes to maybe a healing or something like that, well, my bad. But I'll be burned if I'm going to fail on what Jesus called the least thing I could be faithful in. I'm not going to do it. Come on. Jesus said, if you can't be faithful in the least, that's why you don't get more. I'm telling you, submitting to God is a win-win situation. It is the position that you need to be in. And I know what you're thinking. How do I get in that position? Well, James tells us. He says, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. You know, I like that song that we sing, draw, draw me close to you. But, and the Bible says, if you draw close to me, I will draw close to you. Technically, again, we act like it's all God doing everything. <laughs> God says, what, what, what does the Holy Ghost say through James? Verse 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. I just want to know you more. And come on over here. I just want more of you, Jesus. Then come get some more, and I will give you more. No, you don't understand, but I want more. But he says, draw closer, you get more. No, 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 you don't get it, God. I, I want more. Oh, God gets it. He understands what we're really saying. God, I don't want to do anything, change anything that I'm doing right now. I want to do live, live, watch this, do that, act like this, all that. And you still bless me. No, he said, draw close to me. I'll, close, I'll draw close to you. Come on now. <laughs> Awful quiet over here. The more you go after God, the closer he gets to you. It's a positioning. And the closer he gets, obviously, the more power, the more presence, the more authority that's going to come on your life. The enemy doesn't stand a chance in your life. Remember, when the enemy knocks at your door and, 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 and Jesus answers, you in Christ, well, I, I saw what happened in the, in the desert. The Bible says he left, <laughs> waiting for another season. He'll go over to your neighbor's house and check and see if Jesus is over there. The devil's no match for a child of God who's submitted to the Lord. Amen. He must flee. So, I understand that some of us in here today are, are trying to resist the devil, tired of him running wild through our lives and through our marriages and uh, through our families and, and just making things generally miserable. You'll never resist him in your own strength. Man. So stop trying. You'll never resist him just because you've decided this morning you're resisting him. Your willpower isn't enough. You won't resist him trying to do the right things. You won't resist the devil by just being good, better than most people, living a good life. There's only one thing that will cause the enemy to flee your life, to run. Tuck his tail between his legs and leave. And that's God showing up in your life. That's you submitted to God. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. 
resist the devil. You don't like some of the devilish activity that's going on in your life this week. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. But Brother Tommy, what am I going to do? Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. Yeah, yeah, I know, but what am I going to Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. Now, when I think of submit, that means that's a position, correct? I may have to stay there for a while. When I think of resist, that's me doing something, isn't it? I may have to do it for more than five minutes. Come on, somebody. Amen. I may have to resist him for more than, you know, an hour. I may have to resist, I may have to resist him for more than, you know, 30 minutes. But resist him and he will flee. Hallelujah. When your life is hid in Christ, Colossians 3, 3. The devil don't want none of you. That's the blessed position. We want to be blessed. Our country was founded upon a people that wanted to, to live in a blessed country, that, that wanted their country to be blessed. Today, we want our country to remain blessed. We need to keep ourselves in a position so we can be blessed. Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to anyone. That's Bible. In other words, righteousness will, will, make, will cause you to rise up. But sin and all that, well, th th that'll put you out of position. I'm not responsible for what everybody else is doing, but I am responsible for what I'm doing. You aren't responsible for what everybody's doing, but you are responsible for what you do. And if each and every one of us will do what we're supposed to do, we will take care of the rest. I believe that. I believe that. Y'all stand up with me. Amen? Glory to God. Y'all pray with me this morning. Father, I thank you.